Hey, this is Howie Mandel Does Stuff. I'm Howie Mandel. This is my daughter. Jacqueline Schultz. Hey, what's up? How are you? And coming in saying hello to Lou right now is, I believe, the king of comedy. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Jay Leno. (laughs) Jay Jay, go. first of all, thank you so much for oh, being yeah. here. Thanks, thanks. It looks like I was shooting porn in here. Yeah. Well, it, it was Van Nuys. Yeah. yeah. And Wasn't this a porn studio? I don't, I don't think it was, but oh. uh, I think we were a porn adjacent. Porn adjacent, yeah. Well, yes. We're in Van Nuys, so that would be it. Yeah. Yes, that, that's it. You know what that, you know, actually, I'm going to point out chairs before you start. <laughs> so uh, that booth right there in the corner mm-hmm. is the original center booth from Caesar's Palace. How many times did you play in front of that? Why well, probably yeah a lot yeah yeah oh is that that's that's where it is yeah see. yeah and this is the first time I've we've changed the chairs here yeah but I do have the front row seats from the Tonight Show oh, from right? Burbank in in the other room well, it's more than I got but yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and I have Johnny's last uh, cue cards oh okay I took from underneath the seats so. Jay, <laughs> you know, you don't need an introduction, though I already did. <clears throat> sure. Um, but uh, first of all, I got to tell you, and I, I think I've told you personally w- what you mean to me. You mean so much more to me than just... Well, we've been friends a long time. 40-some-odd years? I know, I know. I remember when you got, the off the, got off the plane. Remember we gave you a ride to the ice house? Yes. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. he's the guy that picked me up. I met him originally yeah. at Yuck Yucks in Toronto. Mm-hmm. In fact, it was then it was small. It was just Yucks. It wasn't until later <laughs> yeah. it you were expanded there and became, of course, <laughs> Yuck Yucks. Yuck. But <laughs> it was originally just Yucks when it opened, and then hey, we made some money. Let's put some more seats in. And, and I know they the hope to be yuck, 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 yuck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you've always been a fascination to me, more yeah, than yeah. just mm-hmm. a friend. And let me let me tell you why. Because when I first came here was uh, hmm. in the midst or the beginning of uh, the comedy store's uh, strike. I guess that's right, yeah, yeah. So for those that don't know, um, the comedy store was owned by a, a young lady at the time, Mitzi Shore, right, right. who got it in a divorce from her husband, right. Sammy Shore. And it used to be Ciro's nightclub. Right. Well, if you ever look at movies from the 50s, they'll pull up in front of Ciro's, and that was sort of the New York-style... <clears throat> Night supper club, club? Yeah, it was supper. like a supper club yeah, and, the, yeah. and you'd see like uh orchestras there and i think that's what, even where lucy did her uh rehearsals right i i, I saw I, that in well the i know like tony bennett and all those kind of people played it it was a legit room so she it was it, like the copa almost. it was like the copa yeah. west yeah and then she got the room in a divorce right and in the divorce sammy said sammy had built this club so that him and his friends he was the opening act for elvis presley right right and he built it so that his friends could come and do comedy right, right. and then in the divorce he said his friends should not show up right right and then she ended up recruiting like young people who just wanted stage time for right, free right, that's, right? yeah that was it and 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 then um, uh, the improv opened up out here, mm-hmm. and w- w- uh, so what happened? Like the, people said that they wanted because the place was packed around the corner, people decided that they needed to get paid because she was making so much money. Was it? Well, what it was was, <clears throat> you know, it's one of those things where they opened. Oh, let me shut off my phone. Look how inside. busy Jay is. <laughs> <laughs> Jay. <laughs> Who's calling? Take it, Philip. Who's, take it. Take it. Philip. Oh, Philip, I'm just shooting. I'm, I'm filming a podcast. I'll call you. Call you back in a few minutes. Bye bye. Call you back a little bit. Bye-bye. It was Philip. You were reading his phone. I was reading his watch. Oh, his <laughs> watch. Okay. Maybe, maybe, Philip. Put, this is my daughter. She. <laughs> I know. I know. Put She's that on, a, uh, I'm a detective. I'll put that on. Philip yeah, called okay, you. <laughs> um, you know, it was interesting. She had the comedy store where we all worked. Uh, Mitzi had a habit of sort of. Well, I think she did it to be helpful, but she would, it got to the point where she would tell people how to do their act. Oh, yeah, I know. Like Jack Grayman was a very funny comedian. Mm-hmm. And I remember she uh, said, you're going to be Jackie Bananas from now on. Do you remember this? No, I don't well, remember. And he'd wear a yellow jacket and she wanted to perform that way. And she, she told Jack Grayman to be Jackie Bananas? Yeah, Jackie Bananas. Is that a true story? Yeah, that's true, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, she, and she didn't like people who were, quote, fully formed. Like when Seinfeld came in, he was a comedian. He'd been working in the New York New clubs. New York, yeah. And he didn't really work though because Mitzi wanted 
people she could mold and that type he of thing. He didn't get spots. He didn't get a lot of spots. No, he didn't get a lot of spots. And anyway, so there was the comedy store and then the comedy store of San Diego, then the comedy store West and Westwood. And then the main room opened up and it got to the point where people were buying tickets for, oh, this is, you know, almost 50 years ago, $25, right? $50 or whatever it was a ticket. And she was making a couple hundred grand a week. Really? And the, and the comics said, <clears throat> hey, can we get cab fare or something? And Mitzi was so insulted because she looked at the club as a college, a place where you learn to be a comedian. Well, so many people at that time, you know, Freddie Prince got seen there by The Tonight Show and ended up getting his sitcom, right? Right, right, and right. And Jimmy Walker. Well, actually, Freddie got seen on the... Uh, on the Tonight Show, he was on with, with Carson. Right, but didn't he get the Tonight Show from being seen? Because I used to see Johnny always say we saw this young kid at the uh, right at the or, comedy store. Right, I'm not sure it was comedy store or whether it was New York. It might have been New York, but that that's again those show business stories kind of thing. But the deal was, Mitzi was very insulted by the fact that people wanted cab fare or at least to get to the club, you know. Right, and I don't think she did it for selfish reasons. I think she just was hurt by this, you know? I mean, this is the standard thing is what usually happens in any, in life, you know? You grow up to go into the father's business and then you become, you wanna be as good as a father or you're better than the, you know, and then the, the an, an infighting starts. So I, I don't, I, I like Mitzi. I didn't think Mitzi was bad. It was just the idea it was like, Mitzi, you know, we, we come across town, we're coming in, the club is sold out. You've got names of people on the board can't throw 25 bucks a comic just to do a set. No, nobody should get anything done. So this turned into a huge fight and the comics went on strike and it got pretty ugly, you know, people taking sides. And Mitzi had a lot of comics that were dependent on her. They lived in her house for free or the apartment that she had for free and they only worked the club. And to this day, a lot of them still only work the club. Well, that was a thing that I noticed about you. When I came, there was, there were teams, you know, there were the improv, the people right. that worked the improv, right. and there were people that worked the comedy store, and right. they didn't work both. You were probably the only person that I know personally that was allowed to, you'd pull up in your motorcycle, you'd do your set, you'd get on your bike, go do the improv. There was no... Yeah, I mean, I went to the work and then I went home. I wasn't hanging out. I wasn't. But the fact that she would book you and Bud would book you, yeah. you didn't have, they were just thrilled to have you on. Well, I was lucky to be able to have a foot in both camps. And I tried not to play one against the other. But, and of course, once Bud found out that Mitzi wasn't paying, well, then he decided to pay everybody. Right. You know, it'd be magnanimous, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, all right. So now you have one club paying and one not. So, why work the club that's not paying? So then it got ugly. I mean, I didn't go back for 30 years. Oh, you didn't, you were out of the comedy store for 30 years? Well, I left because the comedy store just got crazy with the cocaine and the drugs. Oh yeah. yeah. And I remember I was in the back one day and, and Sam came in, Kennison, and he had a gun and people doing coke on the table. And I said, you know, I'm a comedian. I, I don't want to get, when this place gets busted, I don't want to get dragged downtown. And you'd already been in that kind of world, right? Weren't you working like the- uh, Well, yeah, the, mob the, club. The yeah, mob. But, what, but I always, I, I just didn't want to be rounded up. As, I mean, to me, it, it it ruined the comedy store. It became a place for, you know, just sleazy women and creepy guys. And Did you work both clubs? <clears throat> uh, not really. They didn't like me at the, at the improv. Mitzi kind of embraced me. Uh, well, you worked the Ice House, too. I worked the Ice House, but the, the teams seemed to be the improv and the comedy store. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, I, I just stopped going to the comedy store because it I didn't, didn't want to be there the day. I, mean, I Sooner or later, when people are openly doing cocaine, cops are going to show up. And I'm not a cocaine guy. I don't drink. I, I'm, yeah, I just want to be a comedian. You don't even eat vegetables. I, I don't even eat vegetables. That's correct. <laughs> it is true. 1962 you don't. is my last vegetable. <laughs> that is true. He doesn't eat. He's been eating like burgers and I've pizza. Never, I haven't had a vegetable. And, and yeah, no, that, is that true? Is that an exaggeration? No, that's that, 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 actually that is, true. that is true. Really? And so is that, have you written a diet book? <laughs> uh, well, I should write a you diet should, book. You should. Fried food groups, burgers, hot dogs, hamburgers, pizza, pasta. Can I tell you, know. you we eat the same foods as my five-year-old? Well, there you go. You 
You're exactly the same as my five year old. There you go. Yeah. Well, there you go. And he's going to grow up to be a strong, healthy child. Yeah. <laughs> but here's what I always thought. And I wanted, and this is why I wanted you on the podcast. I like Not, how we get off on a tangent. Too. <laughs> well, tangents are my, yeah, are my life. Yeah, but, yeah. but you've always fascinated me. And this is what I find fascinating about you. So, you were, I did look up to you. I looked up to you because I thought, how does this guy, how is this guy, you, you'd show up on stage and kill and you were an amazing monologist even before, you know, I, I think the world knew you, you know, every comic in the room would uh, sing your praises, you know that. And uh, when, and you were playing all the clubs and even when uh, Letterman started doing his show, you were the highlight of his show coming on. Well, you'd come on like monthly, right? Oh, yeah. That was, that was you know, that's probably one of the favorite times of my career. And you it, talk about the TV guide and the... Yeah, because, you know, Letterman and I, Letterman was a great wordsmith. He had the ability to just put unusual... Fav you know, he would say beverage instead of a drink, you know. He he used he just it, it just the kind of like the way Norm Macdonald did, you know. And but he didn't have a lot of stage presence. I mean, he would hang his head down, look at the ground, kind of mumble as he talked. Right. But what he said was funny, so he got good laughs, you know. And I remember I walked up to him once and I said, Man, I love how you, you know, string phrases together, you great wordsmith, blah, blah. And he goes, Wow. Well, how can you be so, cause I, I was like you, I, I didn't have any stage fright. I just go on and be loud and make noise, you know? And he said, how can you do that way? You know? So th that's where our opposite styles. And it worked like when I would go on the, on Letterman show, I knew Letterman got nervous before I went on. So I would always go around the corner and get like a enormous meatball sandwich, you know? And I would stand by the makeup. And when Dave came down the hall, I, as soon as he came around the corner, oh, Dave, try this, try this. He goes, how, how, how can you eat that crap before you get, you're going on in five minutes. Oh, Dave, this meatball, no, stop, <laughs> stop, just get rid of that thing, you know? And it would just drive him nuts, you know? And then I would just bring the sandwich on with me, you know, and then force it in his face and, yeah, you know, and he obviously went along with it. And it was, it was great fun. It was fun because it was the first time in my life I could be, a, I could be funny on the way to being funny. You know, when you did the Tonight Show, you did your joke, and then your punchline got the But laugh. I also thought that your friendship also was... It, well, was, yeah, the was, friendship was, played part, part too. But it was also the first show where I didn't defer to the age of... You know, I grew up in New England, you grew up in Canada. We didn't call our parents by the first names, you know what right. I mean? So when I would do Johnny, you'd say, Jay, call me Johnny. And I... Well, thank you, Mr. Carson. You know, I, 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 it's just, you know, he was an icon. He was 20-something mm -hmm. years older. I, I, I couldn't tease him the way I could. I could go on Letterman and go, hey, Dave, nice tie, Letterman. Where'd you get that? You know, right. You couldn't do that to John. It was like the first time you were working with a peer. That's right. That's right. Yeah, good way to put it. Yeah. So that's why. See, I'm that, a wordsmith. That's a <laughs> wordsmith. That's right. That's why that was one of my favorite times in my career. So I used to watch that and I love that. And then you, and, and deservedly so, I believe that you, you got The Tonight Show deservedly. This is what fascinates about uh, me about you, because I always felt like, listen, I, and I'm, I'm using the word, but I do, I love you, because you uh, have been a good friend, you've always been supportive, you're you're a good person. I feel that you don't defend yourself. I, well, and you it's shouldn't always, have to defend yourself. You know, my thing is... But you don't. Don't believe in yourself. Make other people believe in you. No, 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 really no, no, the, no. But, really but, but that noise is louder than it should be. And the first one that really bothered me is we are in this business. Right. And we're in this business. You, and, and this is what I loved about the, the whole time you were doing The Tonight Show, I never saw anybody, and, and still to this day, I don't know anybody that enjoys their work more than you and has more of a passion for stand-up comedy, right. for showing up to work, for doing the work, for staying up till three o'clock in the morning to write a monologue, to have your friends over, to have the, th you, you are the king of following a passion and just staying and, and being open about what that is. All right, I'll buy that. Okay, so, so here's the thing. So if somebody says, we're gonna give you The Tonight Show, because you deserve it. Right. I, I didn't understand the late night wars. I didn't understand. Well, yeah. Le, le, here, let me finish okay. my sentence. I did not understand Letterman saying that as a friend, 
you did something wrong. You did nothing wrong. I would never got a part in a movie where I said, uh, Lou is sitting here and going, oh, thank you for the lead. Thank you for giving me St. Elsewhere. I'm really good friends with Lou. Lou wants to act. He wants to do a series. <laughs> Give it to Lou. Like, why would you do that? I get Letterman being upset with NBC, maybe because he has a contract with NBC and he maybe felt like he, because he's already- well, here, there were two problems with that. A, Dave had a hugely successful show at 1230. I had been guest hosting The Tonight Show for five years. Right. Uh, there was an incident that happened way back in the, when Letterman was guest hosting Carson and getting huge ratings and all that. Um, one of the NBC suits said, uh, oh, Dave, my kid's coming in from college with his girlfriend. Get him a couple of tickets for the show tonight. And Dave said, no suits and no relatives of suits. I don't want anybody, any plants in the audience. And the executive said, I'm the whatever it is here at NBC. I want my son. No. And I remember the guy telling me that story 20 years later saying, I wasn't going to put up with 20 years of that, you know? And, but it had more to do with the fact Dave, if Dave had gotten the Tonight Show, they would have had to come up with another show for 1230. Right. So they had a hugely successful show at 1230. I was filling in for Johnny at 1130 and the ratings were holding and doing well. And that's the main reason they decided to stay. I mean, I always hear from people how Dave had the show and I came in one day and demanded it and took it away. Well, no, he can't demand it. It doesn't but work. But that's that my way. point. My point is you didn't take a show. You deservedly got a show. I understand him feeling disappointed. Yeah. I understand that. And you just told us a story that we we had never heard before. But I also know just as a human being, you know, you cross somebody who's in a position to right. kind of spread and tell that story and obviously heard it. There are other reasons. I think the main reason is the Tonight Show and the show following it, late night television, right. is a huge fucking money maker for right, these right. people. And you don't want to pull a franchise that's already successful. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So these are the, but the point was that you were getting kicked publicly oh, yeah, for yeah. Uh, kind of uh, negating a friendship, which I thought it, and everybody I could talk to and everybody, but I never heard you. No. The animosity didn't go both ways, right? You never. No. You know what it is? When you're playing football, who do you tackle? The guy with the ball. And that's the way it works. Because look, you know how show business is. Uh, somebody goes on the train show and bombs. Oh man, so sorry to hear about that. Oh man, good luck. Boy, I really like Larry. He's a great guy, you know? Larry goes on and kills. Oh, he did okay, I guess. You know what I mean? I mean, this it's just the nature of- It didn't uh, bother you the way people were talking? Oh, of it course. Bothered, it it course. bothers me. Well, of course it bothered me, but what are you gonna do? You can't do anything about it. You know, but you uh, had of a platform. Yeah, I mean, you I would hear Stern and all the. First of all, nobody wants somebody to see somebody whine and complain. People in show, people who watch show business, oh, there's a happy guy. You don't never explain, never complain. Just go. You know, it's like now with the whole. I get asked about cancel culture and all that. I go, if they don't laugh at the joke, they don't think it's funny. I don't care whether it's right or wrong. If they don't laugh at it anymore. You know, I, I can remember years ago, people did black jokes on the Tonight Show and every place else, you know? It's a different time. Or, or race, racist or, or anti-Semitic or any But that's of not stuff. like cancel, cancel culture is where they'll tell you now that they won't hire you again because they deemed a joke inappropriate well, that's, that you did 10 years ago on Twitter. Well, that's corporate America now. That's not... I don't think this, every corporation, I said, we here at the Acme Foundation do not in any way tolerate sexism or racism under any guise. And then they applaud themselves. And then, and then somebody says something, aha, well, you know, until, unless that person is big enough or famous enough, uh, then of course they get a pass. You know? Right. But that's a different kind of defense. Yeah. I just feel like you deserve, you're an But icon. here's a question. Okay. That worked for me. By not whining, by not complaining, you get a whole silent majority of people that go, hey, I like the fact that you just put your nose to the grindstone and did the work and didn't. 
I could not have how done do you, it. No, how do you not get that, Dad? You are very much like that. You no. are. Like, you say you're not, but you are the most yeah, easygoing he, person that will not. Yeah. No, but he, uh, and he, and I'm pointing at, at Jay. Jay. It's a great thing about radio. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but the vitriol that people were attacking you with and people that we both know oh, yeah. that constantly attack. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a room and told stories about, and, and I'll, we'll, we'll talk about this now for, for a second. Conan and you. Right. Okay. Jay has the number one show on television. And like he said, like in, in Letterman's days, that block of Jay Leno followed by Conan O'Brien is probably the most lucrative two hours it of was, television yeah. in existence. And when that started, Don Olmeyer, after 13 weeks, wanted to get rid of Conan. And I said, no, I think he's funny. And I said, tell you what, Don, I will promote Conan every night. I'll at the end of my show, I'll say, stay tuned for Conan. He's got, uh, you know, so Elton John. Whatever. Yeah, because he had a rough start. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and that worked fine. And that worked great. So listen to this. And so, he knew, too. No, I so remember. I know the story. I know the inside. I meant NBC, okay? So he's kicking ass. This is the most lucrative, you know, two hours of television there is. And ultimately, television is just um, a, a factory. Right, right. Okay. Not only is it lucrative, this guy... And I'm pointing again at Jay Leno has masterminded. I mean, I, I always thought, found this fascinating when you did the Tonight Show. Not only uh, you know is he is it doing well? It's not doing well by accident. You watch the ratings. You know how to book it. You know where the ratings go down. He was the one person that would support me when I had nothing and I was doing hidden howies. You know, I was doing these hidden camera pieces, and he put me on. But I would hand in. Uh, hidden camera things, he would look at it and he goes, I can't, I can't, sometimes, this will not play well. This I, will I would not say to him, Howie, can we lose the caca doo doo bit? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> I mean, that was really what it was. Because I loved Howie, and I thought, but I could just see from our audience, and I would see from Fred DeCordova, who was kind of snobby, that that was not Johnny's, it was still Johnny's sensibility. Right. At that point, you know. Right. So I would say, and how he did, he would say, okay, I'll take out the doo-doo caca thing. And then it, and then he, it would kill it. But fun. here's, but the point of, that I'm making is you weren't on a show that was number one. You were on a show that you m manipulated to be number one. You worked that show. You right, weren't just right. on that show. That was the Jay Leno show. Right, right. So, and NBC and people who watch should be aware of that. That is not by accident. He also supported the show that went after him and the network by promoting and creating that slot after him to be number one. When that came, when Conan's contract came up to fruition, um, everybody, because that's where they want to make money, CBS, Fox, ABC, is, you know, waiting to maybe poach him. Right. They go to uh, to uh, Conan's people, Gavin Pallone. They go to Gavin and they say, we want to re-up the contract. He goes, well, the only way you can re-up it is we need the Tonight Show. He goes, well, Jay's doing the Tonight Show and right. it's number one. He goes, I don't care. We need the Tonight Show. They go, well, Jay's got another five years on his contract, right? Am I, right. if I'm yeah. incorrect, Jay's got another five years on his contract. They go, I don't care then we don't know what's happening in five years. Right. They risk versus reward. They say, well, we're not gonna lose this hour to Fox or ABC. Okay, we'll say in five years. And then if something happens, maybe we'll, in their minds, we'll renegotiate. We'll say you get the Tonight Show in five years. They sign that. Gavin says, I want it announced now. Right. Right? Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm correct. Yeah. I know I'm correct. Yeah, yeah. So they call you, one of my friends called you, and said, you have to announce your retirement. You didn't announce a retirement. You don't want to retire. Look at how right, busy right. you are now. Here's, here's my thing. At the time, I know if you don't do that, you die of a thousand paper cuts. Why? Because little stories will drop about you being uh, disruptive or not doing that, you know? So I said, you know, it, to me, it's like when I would date women, if they don't want to go out with me, I'm not going to beg you. If you don't want to see them anymore, fine, fine. And that's why I said to NBC, I said, you want me out of here in five years? Really? 
Okay, fine. So, okay. Now, but let's be clear. You don't want to retire. No, I don't want to retire. But I said, but I know if you, look, when you make the kind of money you make in TV, to the average person, you have no problems at all. And your problems pale in comparison to theirs. So don't even bring them up. So I said, okay, so go the five years. See, the real uh, thing that threw this was Craig Ferguson. Because I was number one. Conan was number one. All right, the deal was made. Lana, you're leaving in five years. All right. So I said, okay. Well, well slow down. Okay. Slow down. I want to make it really clear. Mm -hmm. You did not retire legitimately. You did not say, you did not announce a legitimate retirement where you said, I've had enough in five years. Well, I think you I said, I, I think I said, yeah, they wanted me to say, I was saying, all right, that's fine. Okay. If that's what they want, that's what they want. Not what you wanted is my point. No. Right. Which I, I would have a hard time telling the world, this is what I've decided to do. Yeah, you're you know you're right it, about why, but it, you're amazing to me that but you- here's, here's what happens is then- the whole machine. Remember, I had no agent. I had no manager. No, never had. Okay. Uh, so then. I know your lawyer. Then the whole my PR thing starts with the attacks. The ratings start to drop for Leno. You know, the, whatever whatever they can come up with, they do. So, you so figure, I would have done. I would have hired an agent or a manager or a, 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 a publicist. You know, if I had to convince you to love me, I'm not going to do that. You know, you like what I'm doing? You know, I never once asked for a raise. They just gave them to me. I said, okay. That's no, great. I know that. The difference you between, know? like Letterman used to, he took, uh, you know, Worldwide Pants, which was the production company, and he used to produce, you know, all these other shows that he owned. He owned uh, Raymond. Yeah, and right, he owned right. all these yeah. other, he made a fortune. He probably made more from that sure, than sure. he made from yeah. the from the late night show. I came to you a couple times. I said, I got an idea. I want to produce something under Big Dog Produ Is it Big Dog Productions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which you're you go, I just do the Tonight Show and I do my stand-up comedy. I, you can't know how much I respected you for just, you are who you are and you do what you do. Well, I mean, that's what it is. See, the thing to this story was Craig Ferguson came along yeah. and then suddenly he was beating Conan and the network went, oh, what's this all about? You know, because his ratings were so good. He won a Peabody Award. He won some Emmys. And then it was like, did we make a mistake? I said, guys, I'm here. And then they came to me and they said, uh, look, the thing with Conan is a done deal. And, you know, next year, whenever. Well, let me, let me, because I know my friend, I want to take you through it, like how you thought of this. Okay. So not only the. You what? just cut him off to take him through how he thought of that. Yeah. Okay. No, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. Go, 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 ahead. go, go ahead. I'll no, let you finish. No, go ahead. Okay. You, you talk. And then. Uh, well, oh, no, no. Welcome uh, to my life. My whole childhood. He cut me go. off to tell me what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know where I was going now. Oh. Was it? Well, good. I'm a good interviewer. Yeah. Right? Good, good, good. No, but here's so, so you announced this retirement against your will. He's going down. I just want to say, I just want people to know everything and I want to get this mm. out. This is stuff that's been laying on my chest. Apparently it's uh, not on yours. <laughs> the, um, they realized really quickly that if you announced your retirement, that ABC, CBS and Fox you're there for the poaching. Right. Right. So right away they say to you, as soon as they realize that, they go, Jay, you can, don't go to another network. We're going to make your show, the same show, in prime time. Right. Which I knew wouldn't work. So the deal I made was, if you pay my staff for two years, regardless of what happens, I'll do it. Because I think they were keeping me in case Conan didn't work out. I think they were keeping you because they didn't want you to go well, some probably, other place. A probably a little bit of both, yeah. Then management, Gavin Pallone, calls the network and says, all right, so we have The Tonight Show at 11.30. You just gave Jay the 10 p.m. show. I think you're fucking us because I'll just tell you as my, myself, if I have something to promote or I want to go on something, I'm going to go on prime time first. You know, there is this war of booking, right? right? right. Where do you go first? You go to Jay first, right? right? You go to the, well, if you go to Jay, then you can't go to, you know, if you go to Fallon, you can't go to. Right. To So, so then he goes, you're fucking us. So now they call you 
And you've said, I'm keeping my staff, which is, you were always amazing to your staff and anybody who's worked for you has the same thing to say. You know, you were there for them. You always supported them. And then they say to you, Jay, we said you can do your show at 10 o'clock. No, no, you can't do the same show. You can't have guests. We'll build your racetrack. Right. Yeah. Well, we could have some guests, but they, wa they wanted the monologue at the end of the show to lead into the new. Yeah, it, it just didn't work. You know? Right. It's but just... anything just to keep you there. Right. 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 Okay. So talk about uh, Craig Ferguson. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> as I said, Craig Ferguson came along, and he was beating Conan, and it was like that. I think that work. Whoa. What? What's this? And they realized maybe this isn't the best idea, and that's where the ten o'clock show came from. Right. I probably would not have jumped to another network. I'm pretty loyal. Um, you're the most loyal. That's why you're sitting here today with me. Well, <laughs> <You're a lo> <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's a, uh, you know, I sleep well at night. I don't have, you know, I would read all these stories how um, I came back and demanded $150 million plus I wanted the show back. And the network had to give it to me. Based on what? How, so, how, so, how, so, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take. That, I'm gonna take you through. I, yeah. This is so cathartic for me. I hope it's doing something for you. All right. Good. Okay. So then, <laughs> have you been sitting on all these emotions for? Oh, like years? you have no idea how many times I've gotten <laughs> in fights, yeah. and I've talked to people that we both know, and go, "What the fuck are you talking about? That's not the way it happened." I know, but and why knows. the fuck doesn't Jay defend himself? You know why? Because nobody cares. Except for him, <laughs> he cares. No, what I mean is, what well, happens is, at the end of the day, pull the numbers. Okay, here we are, 10 years after it's all over. Okay, the Tonight Show was number one the, the whole tenure, except for the first 18 months when Letterman had it. Uh, and that's the only number that counts. No, you and, mean when Conan? No, no. When, when, when Letterman went to CBS, he was beating oh, me. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's not the, the first, Tonight Show. Yes. first 18 months. And then we got it back and, and never lost it. And, and we won in every demographic group and all that kind of stuff. And my attitude was Letterman will get the cool kids and the critics and I'll take the popular vote. And that's pretty much how it worked out well for everyone. And you engineered that. That's not by accident. No, you that's not by accident. You engineer that because you not. could have the cool kids. I talked to you backstage. Well, the thing you was- You have a different sensibility we, in real life than we, you do on we Netflix. Did win, we, we did win all the demographic. You know, I would always hear from Letterman, well, Letterman wins the 18 to- No, we didn't. We won that too. We, we won that. We, we always did pretty well. So let me let me just follow the story because this okay. is this is my therapy session okay. for you on behalf of you. All right. <laughs> okay. So so then uh, the, what happens happens. You're doing your ten o'clock show in prime time. Uh, Conan moves into the Tonight Show, and for all intents and purposes, the Tonight Show is not doing great. Right, and somehow this is my fault. You know. So you get a call. And they ask you, before they ask Conan, because you're still on the network, mm -hmm. would you be willing to go back and do a half hour show at 11.35? Right. Right? Right. Am right. I correct? Yeah, with just the monologue and all that stuff. Just the monologue and maybe one guest. Or, but I uh, said, uh, run it past Conan. Before he said yes, he said, run it past Conan. Now, Conan has not been doing well on The Tonight Show. The truth of the matter is they call Gavin and they say, we'll do the show at 1135. Uh, we want Leno to do it at 1135 and you go on at 1205 and you still have the Tonight Show. You can do exactly what you're doing, but now we're giving you the opening act that has worked for right. the last 20 years, 15 years, whatever, it's, right, whatever right, it right. was. It's that hissy fit that I didn't understand. And then the narrative, this is what bothers me about you, Jay. You didn't change the narrative. The narrative was he retired and now he's taking my job. He was still offered The Tonight Show. They wanted to reprogram it back. You said you go first, you were forced to, I don't know what you did wrong. I don't know what could be interpreted as you doing wrong, but there was this all this hoopla and maybe I live in a bubble where that's not the way people thought. You didn't deserve that negative. Well, my it favorite, sounds like it's only because one person was vocal. So therefore. Yeah. Well, my favorite thing was 
when they came to me, I said, you know, we've been number one for 14 years. And I'm, I'm not going to say which executive said, we want what's above number one. <laughs> I said, well, I said, I'm not, I don't know what, oh, you gotta tell I don't know me. what to tell you. You know, I mean, I just thought that was so funny. And they, they realized how stupid that sounded. They said, what, what they were looking for was, I don't know, more pizzazz. What, you know, when you do a show like The Tonight Show at 1130, you can't be outrageous no. every night. No. It's like Sam Kennison, outrageous, hilarious comedy. But if you do it every night, you can't be outrageous every night. So you have to bring it down a step and you've got to become now, okay, people lying in bed or watching late at night. It's got to be a bit more relaxed. It's got to have a different pacing to it. You right. know? Uh, and the idea was, do you want to be the cool guy and lose the Tonight Show after a few months? Or do you want to keep it going? Well, the idea, it's a business. You've been hired to do a job. So you have to act and perform a certain way to do that job. But that didn't bother you? No. That didn't bother you, the hoopla of you, the, 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 the thought or what people were talking about, about you taking something away from Conan. Well, I mean, I would hear it all the time on Stern and all right. that. And, and, uh, you know, I argued with him about uh, that. You actually called me once after oh, okay. I argued with him. About I always that. heard it on Stern too. Every time I but yeah. when I was on, yeah, once but I mean, you know, the, uh, I stole jaywalking from Howard. No, it, I mean, if anybody stole it, we all stole it from Steve Allen who did it man on the back street, man on the street stuff, you know? So uh, what do you do? It, it, Cause the louder you yell, they're going to yell even louder. But you said you didn't want to say that you were retiring, that you were being forced to retire because of the thousand paper cuts. At this point, when they're saying you move back on and you're taking it away from Conan, is that a thousand paper? Is that a thousand paper? What can they say? I didn't take it back. Why wouldn't you say they called? I, you know, I, I told them to call you. I don't. They're offering me this. I would be called a liar and told be told that wasn't true. You know, if you like, if you. If they say it, it's a one day story. If you then react, you now have a three or four day story. How many times have you seen this? Someone's accused of something and they go, no, no comment. Well, how about uh, no comment? It's not a one day story. All these two stories of you and Letterman and you and Conan became books, became TV oh, yeah, shows, no, became many. That's not a one day story. <laughs> no, what I mean is it, it, it would just, to the general public, it's just, it's like rich guys throwing silver dollars in the ocean to see who has the most money. It's like, <laughs> You know, just nobody cares. I was involved in it and I didn't care. Guys, talk yourselves out. Howard, have a good time. Trash me all you want, fine. You know, I used to love it when he would go on Letterman. I'm going to trash Leno tonight. And then I'd, I'd check the ratings the next day and we would beat Howard. You I know? know. And I would say, oh, okay, that was good. I mean, I don't, I don't hate Howard. It's what he does and that's fine. But he know I didn't steal John Melendez from Howard. I know John, John Melendez was doing. Uh, I'm a celebrity. I'm a celebrity. Get, me, get out me, out me out of here. Okay, so he did that whole show. When he left that show, he came to us and and somebody suggested he might be fun to have him. And I said, well, let's see if there's any problem here. Okay, he was making thirty five thousand a year doing Howard Stern. I paid him half a million a year. Who wouldn't take that raise? Who wouldn't take that job? Plus, he had had another whole TV series in between. So he wasn't even on Howard, but you know, I would hear this thing about, Oh, Leno came in and took him. And then all the, you know, and the minions would call you and berate you. And how does Mavis, Mavis is your wife. How does Mavis, does Mavis sound like that? Does, does she say you have to say something? How is she taking no, all this? She, I, I never brought my problems home ever. You don't have to bring them home. You turn on a TV and a radio, your problems are right uh, there. No, my, we're not listening to the radio. Not, I just, it never came up. You know, my dad, Went to the office and came home. I never knew what my, I mean, I knew what my dad did, but I never heard about it. And you know, the best way to stay married is don't bring your problems home. When the door shuts, say, honey, what's up? We talk about whatever you do, whatever. You're not one of those, <laughs> and then this guy said this, and then they told me, shut up, shut You're up. not working at Sears, buddy. Huh? You don't work at Sears. That's right. The <laughs> point is, every. I can't believe that Mavis doesn't know what went on. Well, I mean, yeah, she knows. And she, she loves you. So did she not, like my wife would. Mom would, yeah. right? like if you didn't say anything, you would better believe that mom would say something. Yeah, yeah, but you wouldn't want your wife out there saying No, something. she wouldn't, but I'm saying that she <laughs> she wasn't on your back to say, you gotta say something, Jay. No. No. No, because look, just say something to who? You've got, you've got an audience that's this wide 
and you've got this little 10% uh, minority yelling and screaming that reaches a specific audience. And I, and I would, I would read things that were so absurdly not true. It's like QAnon stuff, you know? Wait, that's not true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's my case. Can I say something here? I yeah. just want to say that, that, cause I'm a little more distanced from all of this than the two of you. Mm -hmm. You have always been underrated in my opinion. Nobody really uh, appreciates how good you are at what you do. Well, that's right, Cam. But isn't that what you want? Isn't that better than being over? And, and I don't know. I just think that we all have, uh, maybe I have more of one than you, uh, an ego. And uh, I, I don't have an ego. I'm a huge believer in low self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Low are, you self, He's low serious? Self, are you serious? Low self-esteem is a key to success. I'm dyslexic. When I was a kid, this is a cure for dyslexia. Smarten up. Hey, smarten up. Smarten up. Just get slapped in the face, you know? And my mother always said, you're going to have to work twice as hard as the other kids to get the same thing. Okay. And that's what I did. And when you have low self-esteem, you walk in a room and you don't immediately assume you're the smartest person in the room. When I did The Tonight Show, I said, let me find the best producer, best director I can and let them do their job. And when they come up to me and say, hey, Jay, that thing you just did, it sucked. Yeah, it really sucked. Thank you. Nobody had to pussyfoot around. Tell Jay it looked fine, but let's do, all right, we have to do that. You know, and that's why the show worked because we could call it exactly as we see it. So the idea that you have some ego, okay, my, my dear is if you're any good, somebody will save you. So my question is, yeah. you were saying you didn't want to convince people to love you. It wasn't your job to want you there, but obviously there was millions and millions and millions of people i'm not talking about the executives right. going through this that you didn't have to convince that wanted right. you there because you were number one so you wouldn't fight to stay there for those people that were watching you that i was fighting i was fighting yeah. in my own way by do the number of letters that i got saying thank you so much for not getting down in the mud with the other people blah 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 we, we turn you on every night and it's, it's funny and it's lighthearted and you have a good time and oh we know you're going through this and we appreciate it. and yeah i i would say those more than outweighed my little petty oh somebody said oh my ego i'm so fragile you know but you know it's not even your ego first of all i i commend you first and foremost listen i think you're a brilliant comic i think you're a really smart person but then you just dyslexia aside that has nothing to do with your intelligence that you're a good person and a nice person. And, and I think that those are few and far between and you're loyal to your friends and you're loyal to your staff and you're uh, loyal to your wife. Yeah, and, and it pays off though, but it, and it, and it pays hey, off. Hey, listen, you got a lot of stuff and it did pay off. You had a number one show. You got a, I think you have I, I four cars now, yeah, four? You know, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't change anything. And every mistake I made in my life, I'd learned from. You know, there's a story I always tell about uh, why I believe the Cosby women. Because when I was 19, I was a comedian. I was going to clubs in Boston, you know. I went to this one club and I said, I'm a comedian, a comedian. Yeah, you know, the guy says to me, how long have you been a comedian? I said, well, uh, I'm about a year. A year? He said, you got to be in the union within six months or it's a violation. You know that, don't you? I go, no, I didn't. This was the AGVA union, the stage, you know. I said, no, 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 you got to be, I can't, I, I, I can't even talk to you unless you're in the union. This guy gave me this whole big thing, you know. So he says, hey, go down and see this guy. So I go down and see the guy in the Agva office in downtown Boston. It's just like, just an empty office with a chair and a guy in it, you know. And I go in there, how you doing? And the guy, and he says, are you the guy that did, I just talked to so-and-so? Yeah, okay. How long have you been a comedian? And I said, well, almost a year. Well, almost a year, that's a violation. I, I could find you. And he goes on and on about you know, the union, you know. I said, well, I'd be glad to join. How much is it? He goes, $300 a year. I said, well, I don't have $300. And he goes, well, how much you got? I said, I, I got 75. And he takes my $75, right? And he writes on the back of his business card, union man, and signs it. And he goes, give this to the guy when you go back to the club. Now, I knew I was being taken. <laughs> but much, much like the girls in the Cosby situation when he invites him up to the room, you think, is this real? Is this, is this going to be? So I gave the guy the card, and the guy took the card. <laughs> he laughed in my face, said, no, kid, okay, we don't need you. I'm not looking for comedians. I knew I had been taken for $75. But in a sense, I believe that maybe this was true. So when I would see something like 
those women with Cosby, people go, how could they be so stupid to go up to his room? I go, he's the biggest star on television. He's America's dad. Why would you not? If he saw you and thought you were good and told you so, why would you not believe him? You know? Right. And so to me, so that's one of those mistakes that just taught me empathy. It taught me to understand sometimes people do things against their better judgment because they just want to believe so hard and so much that, well, maybe this, maybe this is the way the grownups conduct business. Maybe this is the way show business works. You know, you got to be in this union thing. Wow. Well, I mean, I knew I had been taken, but I wouldn't change that experience for anything because <clears throat> I, I mean, I remember talking to friends of mine, all these Cosby women, they knew what they were doing. They knew that they didn't because I didn't know, you know, I was naive. You know, it is just a matter of being naive. How he introduced me to the president of show business once. <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> I just told him it was the president <laughs> of show business. <laughs> did you really? Was, I did. I, one time we were at the comedy store and I said, Look, I, want, I can't remember who it was, but it was a friend. I just said, you got to meet, we got to make commission. There. This guy is, no, vice president. This guy is the vice president of show business. And you were so. <laughs> I ran over there. He ran over there and yeah. he goes, my name's Lou. I'm going to be on at eight. And then the guy said, will, will you watch me? I remember you coming back to me and going, Howie, you can't believe it. the vice president of show business is going to watch me tonight. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's the perfect that's that's the perfect case you can know? i just tell this story about about you and, and 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 this also illustrates how great you are my wife the very first comedian she ever saw was you and you went on in atlanta and she you did an hour and a half right the next comedian she went to see was stephen wright now she gets to the stephen wright concert and she's waiting in line to go to the bathroom and then uh, she uh, gets something to, to drink and she walks into the theater and she sits down, and Stephen Wright says, thank you, good night. He only did like 30 minutes. Uh, she thought everybody did an hour and uh, a half. She did, you kind of... What, Jay, what car did you drive here today? I drove an Alfa Romeo Julia. It's not mine. It belongs to Alfa Romeo. They let me borrow for a few months. Uh, Wait, why? you just you get to borrow cars? Yeah. Well, I'm a, like a car influencer. I do the car show and all that kind of stuff. Do you like this car? It's you nice. have to say. 540 yes. horse V6. Yeah, it's powerful. Fast oh. car. I like Alphas, yeah, yeah. The beauty of working at NBC and seeing him, he was, you know, when uh, I used to do The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, it was always just a Corvette. There was always just a yeah, Corvette. Oh, he had a, he had a Corvette. He yeah. had a Corvette. I, I don't think Jay drove the same car twice in a year. I remember when you were, weren't you doing your show next to his yeah. show? And yeah. every time I would come visit you, it was so much fun to see what car was parked. Well, was how many different. cars yeah. do you have? I got 201 on the road and 168 motorcycles. 201 on the road. What does that mean? They're registered, all working? Registered, oh, you know, stickers two, and all that. 201, and how many motorcycles? How many are not registered? 168, yeah. <laughs> what is the uh, the most valuable car? Oh, that'd be the F1 McLaren. Which is worth? Maybe 20 mil. Oh my gosh. What year is that? <laughs> it's uh, 1994. Oh, it's used. Imagine if you had yeah. a newer one. Why is, it worth, why is it worth 20 million? They only built 64, and they... You know, I paid 800000 for it, and people thought it was crazy. And then they just went nuts. I mean, one sold last May for twenty. Do Another you trade your cars? Million. Do you ever no, sell? No, you don't trade your car. What kind of talk is that? Well, to sell, <laughs> like you don't want to make profit. No, I never, sell, I never sold any. I don't sell cars. I keep them all. Is the McLaren the one where the, it opens up? The seats are in the middle. Yeah, and, and it op the doors open above the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so, so the... He's a real car enthusiast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. And, and, and does it, it freak... It, it, it's amazing because you talk about this these humble beginnings in Boston, and now you have like over two hundred cars. And do you walk into that garage and go? I love my garage, but you know the funny thing is, I meet all, all my life I meet people. Hey, you know that you're being screwed on that deal. Da 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 da. And they tell me how I'm being screwed, and I go, Wait a minute, you're living at the Oakwood Apartments, okay? I have a house in Beverly Hills. I'm not being screwed. I I know what I'm doing. You know, I I never I never take my money. From my main source of income i use that to get other money you know that you you get gigs because you're on america's got talent you said you well, you never used your tonight no show i money. never touched a dime on my tonight show money you only used your stand-up money i just live on stand-up money because I, I like being hungry if i don't work a week i really do think i'm broke i go oh man I geez, what did i make this i didn't make anything this week all right just give me the single patty Instead of the double <laughs> and a small Coke, no fries. And do you still you, love stand-up? Will you keep doing it? I love stand-up. Yeah. I see him it, at Flappers. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah I love stand-up because 
You don't need anybody. You just, you go there. I remember I used to have a bit where I had sunglasses and I take out the sunglasses, do the bit. And one day I forgot the sunglasses. So I said, I'm not doing that bit anymore. I don't have to carry sunglasses. I like the idea of just being, I can do a show. I can do a show at the drop of a hat. I, 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 I can go. Like this but now week, you don't even have the hat. This weekend I go to Florida and I just, I bring one suit, get off the plane. And six masks. Tell joke, get check, and I'm, and I'm out of there. Yeah. Wow. Is there a car that you want that you haven't been able to get? No, not really. I, I'm always happy with whatever I have. Uh, like I said, be happy with what you have. Just make sure you have enough. <laughs> but is there, you know, a car enthusiast, there's like a dream. Was there something that doesn't exist anymore and you well, wish, yeah, or you're searching for something? Well, I, yeah, I've got a few of those. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I've always been contented with what I have. See, that's the trick. I've never shot for happiness. I only shoot for contentment. Because when you're contented, then you realize, oh, I guess I'm happy. If you're happy every day, it's like drinking champagne every day. Now you're an alcoholic and you just cause... If you're just contented every day. So you're drunk with contentment. Yeah, I'm drunk with contentment. And then I realize within that contentment, I find happiness. I look back and I go, oh, you know, some, I really am happy. And I got no bills, you know, been married 41 years, have a great time. Yeah, I'm fine. Do you, uh, you love the electric car the last time I saw Yeah, I love my the Tesla. Plaid. Yeah, 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 the Plaid. Do you like, uh, do you still ride motorcycles a lot? Yeah. Are you yeah. not worried? You, you've had a couple of accidents in the past. Yeah, you know, when you fall down, over 70. Jeez, it hurts. Oh my God. Have you <laughs> fallen down recently? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you mean, yeah, yeah, yeah? I went yeah, down yeah. about a year and a half ago. And, Jesus, that hurt. What, what did Jeez, you do? Ow, ow, ow. You know? What happened? You know, you're driving a 100 year old motorcycle with no brakes. What do you think happens? You know, uh, yeah, it gets a little tricky. It gets a little dicey. A 100 year old motorcycle with no brakes. Well, you're exaggerating. Minimal brakes, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> You in LA driving? traffic, yeah. You so still driving the motorcycle? He, oh, yeah, I still drive my he, motorcycle. He, he does. He does. Um, the, the motorcycles you're a little nutty with. The the last time I saw you on one of your motorcycles is you have a motorcycle that has a jet oh, engine. A jet engine, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> no, an actual. <laughs> that's at a Bell Ranger helicopter. Yeah, that's yeah. It. But you were at a. You, you told me a story. You were at a. Um, you offered me a ride, and I said no. But uh, <laughs> you were at a. Oh, and I melted the guy's bumper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's, he said a stoplight. The guy behind me, he saw <laughs> Now, if you ever stood behind a jet, you know how much heat. It's 1,400 degrees. A lot of us haven't so stood I'm, behind jets. I'm sitting there, I like see this guy. He's inching forward. What? What? And now he's just right up close to me. And I, I, this motorcycle has a rear camera. I look at the camera and I see his front bumper going. You know, <laughs> <laughs> melting. Just, just melting from the, just. Just you know, <laughs> just deforming from the heat, you know. And I said, "Oh, geez, I got to pull away from this guy pretty quick," you know. So I've never had the opportunity to go to your garage. I want. I, I've well, always asked you. Anytime. I have you, a friend. You want to be on the car show? I'll put you on the car show. I would love to be. I don't. Yeah. I don't know that much about cars. You don't have to fool me. But do you have a dream car? Like, is there a car you'd want to drive? Like I'll tell a, you. I'll tell you Rolls something. Royce I feel like Alex. I, Alex I rented. A, I rented the Rolls uh, to to drive. I'll tell you. I have a friend here who I see him sitting there. Uh, Richard Rosenberg, who uh, you know is much more of a car aficionado. He said, "If there's any time you can get me to Jay's garage, I think I once called you and said, can we come?' And you yeah, said, yeah. yeah. And then I come. But but the only I I don't get motion sickness. I don't. I go on roller coasters. Yeah, I go yeah. on every. I've never. The one time I bought a Ferrari one year. Right. And and a Ferrari. Yeah. Which one? Uh, I I don't even know. He's I just yelling said, it. Uh, the Rich, red one, three eleven. Richard's yelling it. What is it? He's doing this. Three forty eight. Three forty eight. This is oh, three forty eight. That's a three forty eight. <laughs> Richard no, Richard is sitting back there. Three eleven. I don't yeah. know. That's a anyway. I didn't know. Yeah. And he goes, "Well, that's a good car. Can I can I have a ride? So I, can I drive it?" And I said, "Yeah." So he took me through the canyon. It's the only time I've ever gotten car sick in my life was Richard driving me in my car. But I'm Do you not, know he's not allowed to have a standard, stick yeah, standard, yeah. standard yeah. anymore? Why? Um, because I, you could tell how I've interrupted you throughout this. Uh, you can't I, drive a stick? I can. I do know how to. But then I lose interest. <laughs> so what happens is the one time, uh, a couple times, I would uh, be More than my, once. This I, is why you're not allowed I would to. drive home with my wife. Right. And then we just, we got home. And I'd get out of the car. And it was in no particular gear. 
and or no gear. <laughs> right. And then uh, yeah. as I entered and opened the door to the house, we would hear a crash and the car would be rolling wow. back out of the driveway across yeah. the cul-de-sac into with the neighbors. With my mom in With there. my mom. So she no, said- your wife. With my mom in there. Oh, right. not my mom. My mom was never in there. <laughs> I did. That's how much attention I pay. I don't yeah. even know yeah. who I'm driving. <laughs> I had a second thought about coming to the garage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I saw somebody on their way to your show. I think it was Ashton Kutcher on the freeway. My friend was saying he saw him in the new- uh, yeah, electric he took, he took a crab walk. He took delivery of that in my garage. It's like the crab walk. Um, no, uh, it's the electric Hummer. Hummer. But doesn't it have that? You could turn the wheels. Yeah, it'll crab walk. It'll walk sideways or go up. A, like if you're on if you're on rough terrain, it'll help you step. Did over. you see the new car that changes colors? I just saw them introduce. Oh, that's that. the I think BMW, BMW at the CES. Yeah, that's okay. I mean, that, oh, okay. that's a gimmick that's been around for a while. <laughs> Mustang had that a few years ago. A different light. It looks like to be a different color. Yeah. Do you get calls constantly for people wanting to buy things that you have? No, I don't sell anything, so nobody calls me for that. No. Do you work? Do you? How much time do you spend working? Do you? I'm actually, there all the time. I work on stuff. Every, you know, when you work with your hands, you appreciate how easy it is to make money talking. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, it does. It Are does. you a mechanic? Uh, well, not really, but I like to dabble. You but, worked for Rolls Royce before you were a stand-up, right? And Mercedes Benz and a bunch of others. But when you, um, I just did new car prep and stuff. You know, and I, turn I, back uh, odometers, I heard. Uh, odometer recalibrations, we call it. <laughs> well, I call it turning back. Right, right. Well, whatever. <laughs> Fucking people. Right. But the, I always believe the heart is healthiest when the head and the hands work together, if that makes any sense. That's so why you work I with, used to master. You work with your hands during the day <laughs> and then at night. You, you 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 talk and you go, boy, that was this is so much easier than. I've heard some funny stories about you in the out in the valley. I heard a story where, um, you gave a ride to some somebody wanted to take a ride. It was like a a biker guy. I don't know if this is true. A biker guy said, "How fast can this car go?" And it turned out that the biker was actually a cop. No, no, that was uh, no, that was at a Cars and Coffee out in the valley, and I was I was I I brought my McLaren F1, which has three seats, and you sit in the middle. And I saw these two gang looking guys with the teardrop tattoo and all that kind of crap. And I went, Oh, these guys are pretty, pretty creepy, you know? And, and to yourself, one, you didn't say that to them. No, I didn't say anything to them, obviously. Okay, and one of the guys says to me, Hey, did Peter Stevens design this? Now, Peter Stevens is a, a English designer. Design, and I thought, Well, this guy knows, you know, here I am. Okay, I'm profiling this guy. I'm not being fair. I'm assuming he's one thing. Okay, so I said, oh, yeah, I started talking about the car. And I goes, you guys want to go for a ride? He goes, yeah, we'd love to go for a ride. I said, I get in the middle. I go, no, these two big gang guys are sitting on each side of me. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, this doesn't, maybe this wasn't the best thing. <laughs> I goes, uh, go, go up Canaan, go up Canaan. Okay, so go up Canaan. He says, uh, let's go through go through uh, Florida. Let's see what does. So you know those two tunnels? Yeah. Canaan. So I go through there about doing about a buck twenty, a buck thirty. It's like wow, 120 like, miles an hour yeah, through so, a tunnel. So, so as I fly through the tunnel, then I hear I, I, I see a cop. Oh god, I'm gonna get stopped. Like, these guys probably have cocaine and meth and <laughs> fentanyl and everything else in their pockets, you know. So uh, I pull over and the cop comes over and knocks on the door and, he, and he cuts, the door goes up. He goes, License registration. And the two guys go, uh, we're under cover police officers, it's okay. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And they, they were, were cops. Yeah, they were undercover cops. Yeah, yeah. That's a great story. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. You know what? I just want to say, I, I want to say. Caroline just sent a picture of her mom's car. Look, do you see that? How cool that is? That's her mom's car, Caroline. Yeah. Our producer. I don't know what that is. Chevy? What is that? A Chevy? What is that, Caroline? I can't see it. It looks to be a. Uh, let me see. It looks cool. I don't know anything about cars. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a 1954 Chevy. A 1954. Oh, it's a Chevy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chevy. Yeah, it's nothing. Six nothing to Jay. All right, no, never mind. Well, no, I like those. Do, I like all kinds of cars. She's I tried trying to, to do some kind of engine swap to it, so she has questions about that. She has questions about it. Well, <laughs> she should watch his show and his engine swap. I, I tried to get Jay many years ago to talk my son out of buying uh, motorcycles, which you didn't. He has uh, he has five motorcycles. Four motorcycles. Oh, so, good for him. Good for him. Oh, yeah, yeah great. not good for uh, us. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm I try to burn them and uh, crash really? them. Yeah, I don't like them. I don't like them. You're, either. but you said to him, if you get a motorcycle, then I'm going to get a motorcycle. Like that was your threat to him. Yeah, that's <laughs> ooh, how scary. Yeah. <laughs> well, you don't know how I, you know how I drive. That anyway, is. I can't thank you enough for coming by. Oh, you what have is, always what is the bums rush, isn't it? Wow. No. Oh, I'm. Sorry. I saw you looking at your. Oh no, watch. no, no, no. I always look at my watch. No, I know. No, no, no. No, you I'm, don't. I'm teasing you. 
Oh, well, I know it's great fun. Thanks it's been over me. an hour. Hasn't it been over an hour? We've, yeah. been, we've been friends for a long time. And so. I will continue. I would, anytime, anything you ever need from me, I would be there for you. Oh, well, I appreciate that, I, my friend. I love you. You've been supportive. And thank you for allowing me. This this has been good for me to get it off the chest and go. Well, yeah, There's but, yeah, no but, better but, but guy don't you who's agree, more deserving. But don't you agree that people who make a lot of money in this business really have no right to complain? I think that you're absolutely right. That doesn't and, mean and, that I would be that no, way. But, you're a better person right, than but I am. I mean, I don't think the general public has any interest. You know, for example. You keep he, saying that, except they're making movies about well, your fights. He, he, here's an example. If you were to say to someone, oh, I've been working on this routine. This is the funniest routine ever. I've been working on it for six weeks. I'm going to do it tonight. And then you go, oh, wasn't that funny for all that work? But if you see someone like Dean Martin, who didn't really drink, but uh, comes out and appears to be drunk, People love that. that. Oh, my God, he's funny without even, it looks like he's, he's just walking through it. You know what I'm saying? So the idea is if it looks like work, it's work. If it looks like fun, it's fun. And if you go up there and you sort of, and you're angry and mad, I can remember, do you remember Skip Stevenson? Yeah. Skip yeah. Stevenson was a comic. He, he passed away. He was on The Real People. Yeah. And I remember, funny comedian. Okay. Not the best, but funny. But he got a divorce. And he would get up and go, anyway, my goddamn wife, you know? <laughs> and it was like, Jesus. I mean, it really wasn't funny because the anger in his, the anger in his, that's what I mean. You can't, you have to clear your head. You can't be angry. You know, you can't be upset because people don't, they really don't. But I wasn't talking about Have, you, have you ever had a conversation or seen either Conan or Letterman or anyone recently after all that well, happened? Letterman and I are fine. We don't have any problems. We, I mean, he, he's, he's been very complimentary in articles and things in the last couple of years. And we've always been friends. There's always been a mutual admiration. Uh, Conan had some rough feel. I don't, I don't quite get it. I mean, I would think that I would have as much right to be angry as he does. I mean, nobody came to me and said this. I just, one day I got the word, Conan wants you out, you know. What's that all about? Well, he does, you know, and his manager isn't there, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, the fact that he didn't have lawyers that told him the time to needs to start at 1130 always sort of made me laugh. That was, I mean, I had that in my contract, which I drew up myself. Right. It starts at 1130. So when they went to the 1205 thing, they, were, they had no legal recourse because it wasn't in paper. The 1230. So I never got, I mean, I don't have any ill will towards him. I, I would like to see him and say, I would certainly be friendly to him, but I know he wouldn't talk to me because somehow this is, he, here's my thing. If something goes wrong, it's my fault. If you just accept blame for everything, it's a little easier than, well, this guy did. But even uh, for Conan, I'm not knocking Conan. I'm just saying that this is what he was told. He's told that you're going to, I don't know that his, he knows that you didn't want to retire. You were forced to make these announcements. I don't think that he was I don't well, think, it, do don't you think know, he's so. aware that they called you and said, would you go back at 1130 and you said, call him first? Do you think he knows that? Oh, I think he knows that. Sure. You, you really do? Well, I, I, I assume he did. It was, it was been in the paper. I don't think he knows. Well, I think Maybe. that it's been in the paper, but it hasn't. But I, I, look, I think he's a funny guy and I think he's a decent guy. I don't have any ill will towards him, but it is what, it, you know what it is? It's show business. Okay. You know, if two. Two heavyweights get in the ring. One is going to walk out, and one's going to be on the canvas. Okay, and that's the way. That's just the nature of the business. So you need to. You're either friends or you're not. You know. So Howie's point, though, when he says that he felt that you should have defended yourself, that's all show business. Yeah. Well, I, again, I shouldn't have to defend myself if I'm any good. Well, other, you didn't listen. Other people, you never have to defend yourself. I'm always here for you, buddy. I rest my case. No, I, <laughs> and I know what I'm saying is when you have friends like Howie, you let them speak for it, and that's <laughs> no, but it's true. I don't mean that. I don't mean that sarcastically. Yeah. But I mean, to me, if I have to go and go, well, I didn't. Well, I didn't, okay. If if you have people like, it's like the end of a wonderful life, you know. All the friends show up. But you want to know something? I know almost everything about you because I'm a, a fan and been a friend for years. I wanted you to come on. You've you've done a service for me because I wanted to. Huh? I wanted to spew what I knew happened. So you've done me a service personally, but uh, you well, know, no, yeah. I, I, I respect you. Well, no, I, I love you, buddy. 
And I'm always here for well, you. And I can't too. thank you, you enough. I call you, you show up. Whatever you need, I'm here. You know. Yeah. We and and oh, congratulations on that. You're doing your second season of On uh, You Bet Your Life. On yeah, You yeah. Bet Your Life. Yeah. That's doing well. You're on your like fifth season of Jay's Garage. Seventh season. Seventh yeah. season yeah. of Jay's Garage on yeah, CNBC. Yeah. Yeah. So watch that. Look at your local listings for You Bet Your Life with yeah. uh, your buddy there. And 15th season of Jay Long's Garage on YouTube. So that's doing well so. that's great and i would love to be on the show you yeah. don't have to have me because i don't know anything about cars but well, if you i mean i you, think it's funny having just someone who has absolutely nothing about cars nothing yeah, yeah. nothing yeah. i can't even i'm not even good at identifying that new car smell really <laughs> no wow. nothing i know well, i like your grandson's name is axel there you go. Yeah. That's, there you go. That's his name. Yeah. I know nothing about cars. I know yeah. nothing. But yeah. anyway, I know a good person when I meet one. Yeah. I met one. You got talent. You're good. Thank you so much for being well, here. Jay Leno, I ladies and gentlemen. It. Thank you. Thank Number you, one. everybody. Love.